My name is Daniel Bellinson. I'm co-founder of uh, Over the Info. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming offline. online. And uh, thank you uh, very much, Francois and colleagues, for making this uh, so. And uh, <laughs> uh, since uh, during this uh, series of seminars, we will uh, work a lot with uh, over the info data. We decided to dedicate this uh, first seminar to over the info itself. Uh, and I hope that the history of this project will explain um, how we got this data and um, will provide a proper context for, for our discussion. Uh, so uh, today I'm very uh, happy to welcome a couple of my colleagues, which will give you uh, more details uh, about how we are working. Uh, however, first I would like to uh, tell you more about the uh, first years uh, of uh, the project. So. Uh, our project emerged during very, very specific time. Uh, it was the uh, election to the lower part of parliament, to the State Duma at the end of 2011. And uh, specific about this election was not uh, fraud, which was registered, but a huge number of uh, independent um, observers uh, and uh, as soon as the uh, as the results of the election were announced, the observers went to uh, the street, and suddenly uh, the street uh, protest increased almost, uh, I think, more than tenfold. So this is uh, uh, the historical photo of what we've seen during that time. Uh, unfortunately, the authorities also uh, reacted to the rise of uh, the protest in their own way uh, with an increased scale of mass detentions. And a specific problem at the time was that uh, with the protest before, it was more or less easy uh, to find where the detained person is because it was a small group of people where a lot of people knew each other, etc. Uh, but with the rise uh, uh, of uh, um, of, uh, the protest it was absolutely new people and new information needs. People wanted to know where the detainees, relatives were worried, volunteers groups wanted to feed people and help them with uh, transportation. Human rights defenders wanted to know where they are needed. Journalists wanted to cover the events which evolved. That is why we decided to establish this initiative. And at that time, we were also a group of volunteers. And from the very first days, our main tools were phone, hotline, uh, open source intelligence. And at, at that time, at, at, at the first half of the year, we were a relatively unknown project. So uh, during that time, uh, we mostly searched the context of, detain of uh, detainees among our own uh, networks. Um, our main product was the newsfeed. You can see the screenshot of our first website. And um, uh, with the list of uh, the detainees, why we decided to go with the list uh, for two main reasons. First is that we knew that the police officials always under reporting the scale of detentions. And we thought that the list of the names is more trustworthy than just a number. Um, so eventually uh, uh, the media started uh, to use our numbers. Uh, second reason was that we believe that uh, information protects people. So if the public knows that a particular person is in a specific police station, it is much harder for police to exercise violence against uh, these detainees. In 2012, the authorities perhaps uh, shocked by the scale of the protests, have taken a course of uh, repression. Um, there were president elections. Uh, Medvedev, who was at that time, who wasn't at the time threatening the world with nuclear winter, was and was rather a liberal uh, president, got replaced again with uh, Vladimir Putin. 
And uh, particularly because of that, this uh, action happened much of millions during the inauguration uh, day. It was a huge uh, protest event with hundreds of thousands of participants, which ended uh, up with provocation and mass uh, beatings by police. Many people were detained. Authorities initiated the first uh, massive criminal case against uh, protesters. Apart from that, the authorities' uh, dissatisfaction with the civil society was also reflected in the adoption of foreign agent law in the same year and in introduction of first uh, prohibitive uh, amendments to the legislation on public uh, gatherings. So, um, as you see at the very beginning, from the very beginning over there, Info was built on a very uh, specific ground. We were combining journalism and technology and other compounder. So, me, I'm a programmist. Uh, I was a program at the time. My colleague, Gregory Akotin, with whom we initiated this project, he was a journalist. We were working a lot with the date. We were volunteers and we had the strong values. We were independent. We did not support any political force. And we helped people regardless of their political views, which were sometimes very far from our homes. Um, and now I would like to give a uh, floor to Gregory Dunawo, who uh, joined this project almost, uh, almost 10 years ago. And um, he will tell you about next uh, period of our life. Uh, please. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so my name is Grigory Dunovo, and I have, as Daniel has already said, I have been working in Ovidin for for <clears throat> over ten years now, and I'm working as an analyst and uh, sp uh, specified mostly in uh, monitoring the uh, politically motivated criminal uh, reprisals. But I'm going to speak about. Uh, uh, several years that uh, came after the very beginning of the project. This was a period of extension for us in various directions. Uh, first, it was the start of forming of a permanent team. Since well, since the beginning, it was uh, two uh, main two permanent persons and a bunch of volunteers. And after that, it turned into a permanent team of uh, six persons, but. Uh, however, volunteers are still part of our bigger team, so to say, and as you will hear it uh, later. Um, we also became partners with one of the oldest human rights organizations in Russia, the Memorial Human Rights Center that was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022, along with the Center for Civil Liberties from Ukraine and Alice Bilatsky from Belarus. And thanks to our colleagues in other Russian cities, uh, in 2013, we started to monitor Detentions not only in Moscow, but also in St. Petersburg, Nizhny Novgorod, Voronezh, and later Saratov. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the events of 2012 uh, that were partly mentioned by Daniel uh, and also in the uh, further years made us understand that detentions can turn to criminal prosecution. One of the main example is the Bolotna Square case that uh, Daniel has uh, already mentioned, but it was not the only case, and we could see that uh, the protesters were charged with um, committing violence against the representatives of power, whereas the policemen who committed uh, violence, much bigger violence, were never mm, uh, uh, given any uh, criminal responsibility. Uh, and uh, we monitored the development of uh, Balotna Square case. And this was the foundation for us to look at detentions and limitation of freedom of assembly as part of a much bigger picture uh, of politically motivated reprisals in Russia. So uh, we started to gather and publish information on these reprisals, not only via short news, but also via bigger reports. And up to <clears throat> 2015, we published three reports on politically motivated reprisals, including criminal administrative and extrajudicial ones. Next slide, please. Uh, 2014, as you all know, uh, is of course the year of revolution of dignity in Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. Uh, the reaction of Russian authorities to what was happening in Ukraine 
caused a wave of protest in Russia. And uh, th that was what we were all facing, and I will speak about it a bit later. Uh, that year, after having contacted Ukrainian human rights organizations, we started to monitor violations of human rights in Crimea as well, because we could see that uh, the Russian authorities were transferring their practice of pressuring the protests and the opposition to the peninsula, like uh, limitation of freedom of assembly, detentions, politically motivated uh, criminal cases, uh, attacking and kidnapping people. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, uh, 2014 was a year of mass detentions of several events of mass detentions in Russia, not only at anti-war rallies, but also at mass gatherings on days of pronouncing the verdicts in significant uh, criminal processes like the Bolotnaya Square case in February and the case against Alexei Navalny and his brother Oleg in December. Uh, the authorities answered first to the Ukrainian Maidan and also to protest rallies in Moscow in the beginning of the year by toughening the punishment for taking part in rallies, like uh, increasing fee, uh, fines, for instance, and also including a new criminal article uh, on numerous violations of regulations to hold public events. In 2015, it was uh, used for the first time against Moscow activists. And so far, 18 people have been charged with this article. And we tried to analyze it thoroughly as the bill uh, was passed, so passed all the readings, and later on. Next slide, please. Uh, this year, the, the year 2014, due to the uh, mass detentions, was the reason for us to organize a campaign of uh, legal aid. We uh, didn't have uh, our own legal department at that time, but uh, we organized a coalition of several human rights organizations, including a Memorial Human Rights Center and Public Verdict Foundation and uh, Lawyers for Constitutional Rights and Liberties. Uh, this was also the time when we published our first legal instruction to people who wanted to defend themselves in court. Next slide, please. Uh, the crackdown on human rights organizations started in 2013. Uh, the authorities started mass inspections of NGOs throughout the country, and first organizations appeared in the register of foreign agents. And in 2014, all the member organizations of the coalition um, that we organized, as I, that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, were deemed foreign agents. Uh, data that we started to gather uh, about uh, so-called foreign agents and undesirable organizations, another kind of pressuring the society, uh, formed the basis of the project called Inateka that we are going to speak about in January. Next slide, please. Uh, the years I'm speaking of uh, were also the time when, when we start collecting the database on politically motivated criminal cases in Russia. Uh, and we established a database, uh, and recently we have significantly uh, reworked and updated it. The date includes over 3,000 uh, items concerning politically motivated criminal prosecution. And we are going to present it on one of the next seminars that will take part on November 17th. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gregory. I will continue for a bit. So what is happening with us uh, during this uh, next years? Uh, so in 2015, 2016, the detentions were more or less constant. However, there, there wasn't big mass detentions. And uh, at the end of February, one of the uh, prominent opposition politicians, Boris Nimtsov, critic of Putin politics, was shot dead near Kremlin. In May, in May, authorities started to completely ban in uh, the work of uh, foreign foundations, which were supporting many uh, uh, civil society organizations through the new law um, on desirable organization, which uh, Gregory already mentioned. This law also criminalized the connection with the banned organization. And during this period, the legislation on public gatherings and foreign agents again got tightened. At the end of 2016, 
um, uh, Alexei Navalny announced uh, uh, his uh, decision to run uh, for president office. And during next years, during 2017, a new wave of mass protests happened, mostly related to this uh, presidential campaign. Navalny and his uh, team formed a huge uh, uh, network of uh, volunteers, the network of uh, election headquarters across the country, and uh, people uh, who were working for this uh, election campaign headquarters were persecuted almost um, um, every, uh, every day. And uh, you see here the diagram. We made a special project at that time, uh, which showed the calendar of that years with the um, uh, uh, persecutions which we uh, registered every day uh, related to uh, Nav Navalny. We call this project Everyday Navalny because that was what was actually happening at that time. And um, anti-corruption film about uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who was prime minister at that time, uh, triggered mass protests and subsequent uh, uh, mass detentions. That year, ODN4 became a national uh, nationwide project. We faced a new scale of uh, uh, the tensions we had to learn from uh, from mistake uh, from mistakes we made in order to uh, continue um, our work. That was a very difficult time for us. Um, many things that were established at that time um, relevant uh, today. So I would like to give the floor back to my colleagues who describe how our project is functioning in more details. Sasha Badashov will describe work of uh, monitoring team which. Uh, 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 work uh, which work lays informational foundation uh, of many of our products. Sasha, please take the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes, my name is Sasha. I work primarily as a news editor in Over Info, but I will work. Uh, I will tell you about monitoring work in general, which is twofold. Firstly, our monitoring team connects with victims of repression directly. And through these connections, we not only get to know what is happening to them, but try to help everyone affected by providing legal advice and helping them with lawyers. And secondly, we act as a news agency and we create news about repressions, both on our internal data and on uh, monitoring of uh, outer projects. And this information from our use and from our connections we use in our data, which our the info team later use in reports. Uh, next slide, please. So there are three ways in which uh, people can communicate with us. That is hotline, chatbot, and email. First two are primary and email is a supplemental. Uh, what do we do when we connect to people? First of all, we're trying to help. We give them legal advice. Uh, we provide legal assistance from lawyers and we redirect them to our project if we can't help. Also, we uh, disseminate information. Uh, so if a person is detained, for example, we ask if they agree to uh, be a part of our news. Uh, and... Uh, we collect information in our system, so later we can analyze it in the reports about the uh, situation in Russia in general. Next slide, please. The chatbot is what? one of our main instruments. It is firstly uh, just a way of communication with operators, but it is more than that. It is also an interactive guide on how to defend yourself. We post all our legal instructions or our advices in the website, but uh, in most uh, cases, it is more uh, convenient to people to use Telegram bot. So that is why our main recommendations are available in the bot. Uh, for example, if a person is detained, they can push the button saying, I'm detained. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, so this is the bot interface. Uh, they can say they can push the button "I'm detained" and bot asks them to provide the details so the operators know how and where they can be helped. And uh, bot also provides some instructions, for example, how to speak with police with the policeman, uh, how to for how long the person can be legally detained, something like that. Uh, next slide, please. 
And yes, as I said, uh, the second part of our job is uh, news related. Since the very beginning of the project, as Daniel already mentioned, we believed that uh, information protects. That is to say that uh, spreading information is not crucial just for people to know what is happening in Russia, but also is a, as a way to help directly the person affected. Uh, so we believe that if a person is detained and everybody knows that they're detained, it is less likely that uh, violence or tortures or other mistreatment will happen to them. Uh, that is why our aim is to spread a word about every detention and about every criminal case. And thanks to our internal resources and thanks to uh, outer resources, we became one of the main uh, sources of data and what's currently happening. Uh, yes, uh, this data we uh, provide in our news every day and also we collect them in, collect this data in monthly bulletins and prosecutions and also we use this data in the reports, as I already said. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sasha. So, uh, but uh, completely other thing is happening than uh, mass detention started. That's completely um, a different style of work. Uh, it looks completely differently. This work is very, very complex. Uh, there is a need of exchange of information with uh, thousands uh, of people. Uh, just imagine that Buses with detainees end up in uh, hundreds of police stations of different cities. And just to collect this information in real time, what is happening, uh, consulting these detainees. All of that requires the work of more than 100 of people every time. Um, if we look at the fate of uh, detainees, there are two primary groups. One who left imprisoned without access, uh, mostly without access to the mobile phones and have to be sentenced uh, during 84 hours. Another one which is released before the trial, but the trial will take uh, place over the next uh, few months. All of this creates a huge scale of work for several months. So it's not only a day of mass detentions, it's really months of, of uh, very difficult uh, work, which is requiring the involvement of huge numbers of people and regular data exchange. It would be a complete mess without a strong IT products, which allow us to deal with this uh, complexity. So now I would like to give a word to my colleague, Asta Kavrova, who will tell you about the work of um, our IT department. Please, Asta. Hello. Mm, nice to meet you, everybody. So, as it has been mentioned, over the info has always operated in two modes, regular mode and the so-called battle mode in the days of mass rallies. All our technological leaps mostly occurred during these days. Nowadays, no. the tech... Uh, nowadays, a tech team of 10 people takes part in uh, the development of our tech products, maintains the infrastructure, and takes care of IT security, uh, from training to handling accidents. Uh, I should mention that security was always a big priority for us because we operate with sensitive information and uh, we've experienced all kinds of, of attacks on the project. We've had a DDoS uh, attack on our website, an attack on our hotline, and even a power outage in our office. And it required us to um, think of something, uh, how to cope in these situations. So, uh, the nature of our work uh, is such that there is a big difference in the number of people we help from time to time. Our um, internal product okay. called Corastel, by the name of a bird species, is a perfect example of how we approach communication flows and scaling. Uh, okay. okay. 
Uh, it's been a long road to developing the most convenient, convenient tool. Our operators who are trained to use this service and work in shifts use this tool to get all the needed information Um, Astrid, we can't hear you anymore. Are you with us? She left. She left. She left. Maybe she will come back. Um, she's. It's. Uh, she's still online. She's still alive? Yeah, she's still, she's still here. Oh, no, she left. She left. No, she left. Okay, I think we should uh, move, uh, move uh, forward. Mm. Okay, so, yes. mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what was uh, about to say is that, uh, yeah, this is how this work to, uh, during mass attentions uh, it's looking from the other side of of your devices uh, and what is brilliant that is just uh, imagine that situation that you have hundreds of people who are working uh, on the same chatbots on the hotline and it requires a lot of work of, of technicians uh, just to connect that people instead of that we are taking completely different uh, approach, uh, automating everything. So we don't need all the technicians. Uh, we have special programs which are setting, scaling this uh, uh, system according to our needs, and we are actually applying the same the same idea to um, different uh, type of uh, products. Well, um, another thing which we wanted to show you is how we're approaching um, our work with uh, judicial documents. So at, at some point when, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the protest scaled to, to, to the whole country, uh, we decided that it is a time to help people and lawyers with the generation of Document. So at first, we started to do that with the formal legal motions. Uh, when then we did it to um, make easier the process of the appeal. And then we started to uh, generate complaints to the Euro European Court of Human Rights. Not completely, but you know, when you are doing that, you are fulfilling crazy amount of. Uh, papers which are looking absolutely uh, the same and in fact uh, you have to describe the case and that is what the lawyers should do. So we reduce significantly the time of the lawyers which they spend on the, this uh, paperwork allowing us to uh, increase the flow of uh, complaints and so for example last uh, uh, year uh, it was um, uh, more than thousands of complaints which we uh, Send. But it is also a tool of legal awareness. So when the people are working with uh, uh, these documents, when they are working with our lawyers, they uh, started to understand how the system is working and how some many of them actually defending other people afterwards. Nowadays, we have a special project which we called uh, uh, Generaptor which helps to, uh, people to prepare for their trial, to change the results, to um, appeal in different instances, and to send documents to Human Rights Committee of United Nations. But uh, we also uh, we also worked a lot with uh, judicial statistics, um, uh, because in Russia, uh, the um, Supreme Court uh, is um, uh, publishing uh, the statistic, which is looking like a, a, a big amount of tables, and it's almost impossible to deal with them. So we had, for many years, we had the idea that 
we need to compile them to the one single system, which is finally uh, would present us a picture how uh, how um, uh, the um, uh, law enforcement is uh, actually uh, looking out uh, like throughout the years. We will talk about this uh, uh, project, which is called Dostoevsky, um, and on our seminar in June and April. And um, another very important uh, thing is how we are dealing with the judicial act. So in Russia, by law, the uh, courts are, should publish judicial acts. And uh, it is very important source of information, which is, from the one hand, allows us to understand what is happening, actually, the scale of uh, persecution. On the other hand, it is a very important uh, uh, way to, uh, uh, which allow us to analyze how the justice system is working in Russia. So again, uh, we will discuss that uh, during a seminar in March. And, and, and finally, uh, the, the uh, IT team uh, and IT department of Oden Info is also benefiting a lot from the community of uh, IT volunteers, which are helping uh, to develop our, our products, to test our products, to uh, improve them um, with, uh, uh, with the latest uh, technologies. And now, um, um, I would like to give a floor um, um, to Ivan Titov, who would uh, tell you more about uh, the work of uh, uh, of volunteer department. Ivan, please. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan, uh, and I'm one of volunteer coordinators of OVD Info. So I will speak about uh, our work with volunteers. And immediately, I would like to switch to the next slide. Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, speaking about volunteers actually is extremely rewarding and uplifting. And a lot of work depends on their support. They su and their support also shows us that our work is important to many people, not only for us. However, information about volunteers is very sensitive. So uh, that's why I will show you only generalized data. And we sh we'll sh I will share only our view of what they do, how the work is organized, and what we achieve with our help. OVD Info relies on support of volunteers from its creation uh, since uh, the beginning of 2010. And in the beginning of 2000, uh, the end of 2017, uh, with the growth of, of and development of our team, uh, the work and communication with the volunteers was separated in a special and separate branch of our work. And we have a, some small sub-department dealing with volunteers. As of today, we have about 5,000 volunteers, which help us routinely day to day. And every day there is a new task uh, shared with volunteers and they, on a volunteering basis, obviously they can say yes or no and take part in that uh, task. So how do they help us? What do they do? Uh, initial and the most prominent and important thing that they do uh, mm -hmm. is helping us okay. hotline and chatbot uh, during mass detentions. So what do they do actually there? Uh, they advise the detainees, uh, help us to collect information about violations of human rights by authorities. And I need to admit that it's by far most demanding and hard work. We are all extremely grateful for their help because during the mass detentions, there are like 20, 30 volunteers uh, on our hotlines, chatbots, all the time, 24 hours replying, uh, people along with our teamwork, along with our team. Um, apart from mass detentions, uh, other tasks uh, include development of ROT solutions that were mentioned in previous section. And also our volunteers help us with translation, localization to various languages, most of our media sources. They help us with uh, collection and analyzing the data from public sources. They also update this data uh, tag it, et cetera. Uh, there are many more other tasks, uh, such as illustration, design, uh, audio and video transcription, and many more. On the right, there is a pie chart illustrating the relative volume of our tasks, which rely on volunteering support. So translations lead the way, almost one third. Uh, and then it's followed by 
general activities, professional and, and, and professional, like transcribing. Then uh, there are data analysis, IT, so everything I mentioned before. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you may ask, who are those people? What do they do? Unfortunately, we cannot disclose this information about the professional or any other background, but we can show a bit of data on the competences and activities within OVD Info. Uh, so again, uh, translation skills are the first ones uh, because more and more we translate and share our data um, in, in the world, in uh, mo most maybe prominently in English speaking world. And then after translational skills, uh, a lot of people possess data analysis, uh, while some other professional like IT or unprofessional skills uh, score another half. Uh, so that's basically the generalized portrait of our volunteer. And the next question would be, why, why are they helping us? What do they do? Why do they do it? So the main motivation is to be involved in something they consider very important in their life. Uh, and this answer is very simple and difficult at the same time. As my colleagues already said, uh, the various events in Russia, they are really grave and people cannot just stay aside. We see how, how people react on those events in Russia by applying uh, for volunteering with us. And um, on the right, you may see a graph of applications uh, so via a timeline and immediately one can see the peaks and these peaks are related to Navalny arrival, then detention and trial, uh, the war uh, in the February 2022, and then there is a small peak around the, draft, the military draft in September to, uh, 2022. So we see that all our volunteers, they come to us as a uh, yeah, as uh, one of the sources maybe to help and to support civil society. In principle, um, everyone can become volunteer. We do have, uh, so to say, non-professional tasks, but many tasks and more and more with time, they require specialized training or a certain professional background. Um, however, pardon? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so, and um, yeah, many, many volunteers are willing to give their time and they provide, uh, provide us with their help. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to conclude my part, um, I want to say that yes, uh, those 5,000 volunteers, they really cover uh, with surplus the demand for our tasks. So after the Russia's full-scale invasion in Ukraine, we started to help our volunteers to help other initiatives, uh, we share our values, and basically what we do, we facilitate their help. So um, other projects are coming to us, uh, coming to us and asking for help with several uh, various tasks, and we facilitate the help from our volunteers. So uh, we also make sure that uh, other initiatives in Russia are not alone and they struggle with uh, support of civil society. Thank you, that was my part. Thank you very much, um, Eva. Uh, so as you can see, we learn how to scale our work with the help of technologies, with the help of volunteers. But uh, one of our main tasks is to provide legal aid. So now I would like to ask my colleague, uh, Julia Schirina, to explain what we are doing in this uh, direction. Julia, please. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, in my part of this brief introduction uh, to our main activities, uh, I'll focus on legal aid direction and uh, the structure of legal aid direction in over the info. As for uh, data collecting, uh, now we are trying to count every hour activity carefully just to mark tendencies and to use this data further and or to give it to our colleagues to use it further. Uh, so uh, in our day info, we provide both uh, direct and a remote help. By direct aid, I mean that we hire and coordinate advocate lawyers uh, and uh, public defenders 
uh, who help our beneficiaries uh, in um, um, course of uh, various uh, instances, uh, both inside the country and uh, in international institutions. Uh, from the very detention to administrative or uh, criminal proceeding, uh, lawsuits uh, against police and appeals to European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, or uh, to the UN Human Rights Committee with which we started uh, working recently. Um, we could turn the slide. Um, of, of course, so we do not take uh, all the political cases uh, um, and uh, we should focus and we focus on two types. As Daniel and my colleagues uh, have already said, uh, the uh, primor, uh, primary uh, type of cases uh, is uh, our cases um, about violations of uh, the right to freedom of assembly, but also from the beginning of full scale invasion, uh, we are working with the uh, um, cases which are based on public expressions of anti-war um, position are persecuted um, under certain articles of administrative and criminal Russian law. Uh, here on the screen, you are able to see some figures which illustrate uh, the scale of our job with administrative proceedings. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, despite that in the Russian legal system, administrative proceeding is a light version of a criminal proceeding. Um, some articles are very tricky and um, when uh, the um, uh, when a person gets one article twice, administrative procedure uh, proceeding could lead uh, to a criminal one. Uh, that is, for example, how works uh, the um, uh, article uh, the one of the new articles about uh, criticizing Russian army forces. Uh, we could turn on the slide. Uh, of course, uh, we also sorry. Uh, of course, we also work uh, with the criminal proceedings and we are trying to help uh, as much people as we can. Um, but we obviously see that the tendency is that um, the quantity of cases, of criminal cases, uh, is growing. Um, and um, 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 But we are, um, we are fighting <laughs> uh, very, very hard to cover uh, as much as, as we can uh, from the very beginning, from the search or interrogation um, until the period even after the trial when the uh, person is imprisoned. Uh, our colleagues uh, are trying to uh, send advocates um, uh, to the uh, prisoner and also to be in written communication with him or her and to use these letters to help uh, people which are imprisoned because of their um, political or um, belief uh, beliefs or civil actions. We could turn the slide. Um, of course, um, for four years we worked very close, uh, very close uh, with the European Court of Human Rights. Um, uh, for example, in uh, 2021, uh, one quarter of all the cases in European Court of Human Rights were from Russia. And of course, not all of them uh, were from uh, over the info, but just imagine uh, the scale. Uh, and um, now following Russia's withdrawal from the Council of Europe, uh, of course, uh, that's a pity that this option is now closed for us. Um, we are still uh, sending there some cases, but um, um, it's like the um, um, <laughs> okay. Um, but um, soon this practice would be completely finished. Um, and uh, we started working with the UN Human Rights Committee, of course, uh, because uh, we are we were looking for some opportunity for our beneficiaries uh, to. Uh, have uh, justice which they cannot get in uh, our native country. Uh, but of course, uh, the decisions of this committee are not binding. Besides, uh, the committee uh, was not prepared for uh, work uh, with um, lots of appeals as we worked with European Court. Uh, so the capacity is very low and we are struggling to find uh, more possibilities for our beneficiaries to search for justice outside Russia. We could turn the slide. Um, 
despite all this effort, uh, um, we are we are helping only um, a small percent of those who need help with our direct legal aid. Partly because uh, not all the cases are um, for, uh, of our expertise. Partly because not in all the parts of Russia we have advocates, lawyers, and public defenders who are ready to work with us. Um, but there we have uh, a remote legal aid for this purpose. Uh, we have a day and night hotline where our lawyers are consulting um, by phone, by email, or uh, via chatbot. And um, they are trying now when uh, uh, they have time to consult everyone um, without regarding to the article or uh, to the cause uh, of uh, detention or of possible detention to help as much people as they can. So they are uh, superheroes. Uh, you could turn the slide. Uh, and uh, besides, we are trying to have close uh, relations, close partnerships with the uh, uh, human rights organizations in Russia, uh, just to um, divide cases. Uh, uh, if uh, we, we cannot take a case, if it's not of our expertise uh, or uh, because of some other reason, we communicate with our colleagues from different organizations and uh, uh, mostly we find an organization which takes the case, but of course, uh, it's not 100%. We are trying oh, to them, yeah. um, but it's not 100% sure. Uh, nevertheless, with all these uh, efforts, we are not covering uh, everything that we want, but uh, we really struggle to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Julia. Now I would like to um, tell you a bit more about uh, year 2021. It was a very important year for our project. Uh, the year began with the detention of uh, Alexei Navalny, who returned to Russia after receiving a treatment in Germany. Um, he was previously poisoned with a nerve agent. And as soon as he came, he got immediately arrested, uh, just in the airport. And, um, at the same time, his colleagues, uh, his colleagues launched an uh, anti-corruption film about Putin and his uh, great palace. So, uh, so the protest, uh, so uh, sorry, the protest against parked across uh, the whole Russia, as well as largest ever mass uh, detentions. More than 10,000 of people were detained just during a few days. Criminal cases were initiated against more than 150 people. And But it's not uh, the only thing which, has happened, which happened during uh, this uh, year. Uh, it was the year then the authorities started intensively using uh, foreign agent lists, including against uh, individuals. And we also were labeled uh, uh, as a foreign agent during the fall of the year. But um, as a response to that, we convinced more than 200 of the biggest media and NGOs of uh, Russia to demand full abolition of this law. We then collected uh, 260,000 of signatures and even drafted a very complex law which uh, repealed this concept from, I think, more than 50 existing laws. And that was one of the last big public campaigns in Russia before the beginning of the um, full-scale invasion. However, the uh, lawmakers responded with, with uh, formal rejection. Uh, although the discussion shifted a bit, but uh, in reality, in a few months, we were accused of uh, promoting terrorism. Our main partner, Memorial, was dissolved on the grounds of breaking the very same law of foreign agent, and uh, full war broke out. So full-scale war has been a difficult and important change uh, in the life of many, many projects. And now I would like uh, to give a floor to my colleague Daria Karelenko. She will tell you uh, how it affected the data we are collecting. Uh, Daria, please. 
Uh, thank you, Daniel, for giving me the floor. Hello, everyone, and thank you, everyone, for coming today and for your attention. I'm the manager of the data department in Overday Info. And the good news, if you want to know more about our work with the data, uh, you can always attend the seminars in the upcoming months. Uh, as my colleagues highlighted, over the Info started as a project counting detainees, and this was the first pieces of data we ever collected, and we continue to do so to the present day. So, uh, freedom for assembly, uh, not only detentions, but also some trends inside these detentions, the topics of the public actions, or the administrative proceedings uh, regarding freedom of assembly, and also data on political criminal cases, uh, which appeared a bit later, uh, were the ground for our work and consequently our data for many years. Along with the tensions, we noticed other trends around the assemblies, uh, persecutions, legislation, etc. And as mentioned in 20. When we were recognized as foreign agents, we also decided to make it everyone else's problem and started a huge campaign on abolishing this legislation and also made an easy to use data set called Inatiaka, where we collect organizations and people recognized as foreign agents and undesirable organizations and categorize them. What did we do with this data? Uh, as I mentioned, we ran campaigns, either just public ones or advocacy, both in and outside Russia. We analyzed our data for various reports, for strategic litigation cases, and also just for having facts on what is happening in the repression field for ourselves and for other analytical materials. Uh, and also to tell the story about Russia and human rights violations inside Russia. We saw we that we uh, uh, next, next please. Uh, we uh, saw that the repression gradually intensified. intensified. Only after the start of the full-scale invasion, we saw what this all was leading to. Inevitably, inevitably, after the first hours after the invasion, we got to work. And soon we realized that we have to expand the data that we collect. Some things like detentions and criminal and administrative cases were we were already familiar with. We had some tools. Some we had never worked with before, so we have to learn uh, how to do this. And some are still quite a challenge for us. For instance, uh, the extrajudicial pressure, because it's hard to get the most accurate uh, data on this. Yet we try still to this day to find uh, new ways to collect and verify that data, as well as new ways to use it and present it. Uh, we continue to do large reports. Uh, but we also switched to shorter analytical materials on particularly interesting points. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, switched to short analytical materials on particularly interesting points, for instance, trends on forced apologies or the growth of prison terms and sentences. We scaled up our advocacy, which my colleague will tell about in a minute. We do joint projects with large media outlets like Washington Post, BBC, New York Times, and we do monthly analytical reports on repressions. We do two monthly bulletins, one that covers uh, the persecution of Russian anti-war movement, and another one that covers other repressions beyond that, because unfortunately, the repressive practices are way wider than only targeting anti-war expressions. And we saw that there is an interest in both part of this uh, picture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the particular challenges now is collecting and updating the data on criminal persecutions. Only the number of people per persecuted for anti-war activities is closing 750, and we know about hundreds of other cases, not anti-war ones. Not only well-known activists have been persecuted, uh, but also completely unknown people. Uh, who wrote about the crimes of the Russian army uh, on social networks. For instance, more than 70% of those persecuted are not from Moscow or St. Petersburg. And that makes it harder for us to obtain, verify, and update information. And the amount of data we are facing uh, and have to monitor grows monthly. Uh, yet we learned to live with it. And we uh, opened a website uh, with detailed data on criminal repressions for anti-war stance. You can see how many people were persecuted for what, under which articles, etc. And of course, we plan on expanding it, a uh, number of visuals, uh, so stay tuned. We also ran a completely 
uh, and constantly updated chronicle on uh, anti-war persecution in several languages. And of course, it would be impossible to do all this without our IT team and all the colleagues. The work helps us to maintain, update, and translate everything we do with data. And next slide, please. And in addition to all this, uh, we also uh, we also collect information for judgments and uh, use this data to assess the dynamics of repressions to use this in higher courts like European Court of Human Rights or Russian Constitutional Court. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Daria. So um, as you see, our data today is uh, unique source of uh, information about uh, repression in Russia. And we are not only trying to pass this uh, information to people inside Russia, but also to inform international institutions. And so um, I would like to give a floor now to my colleague, Violeta Pitzner, who would uh, uh, give you more details uh, about this uh, part of our work. Please. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, my name is Violeta Fitzner, and I'm a leader of advocacy team at OBD Info. And today I'll tell you a little bit about how we use our data of OBD Info during our advocacy work. But first of all, let me explain what our team does and what exactly I mean when, when we say that we do advocacy at OBD Info. So first of all, we prepare reports and other written submissions to international institutions, such as the UN bodies, for example, and we organize and participate in conferences and other meetings with stakeholders about human rights situation in Russia. We also prepare and submit some statements and we do many other things. And when we do it, we always rely on our data. In particular, when we prepare a report or participate in a meeting about human rights, we always include there a data on the political persecution in Russia and the violations of freedom of assembly, association, or freedom of expression. So we indicate, for example, how many people were detained during protest or how many organizations were recognized as foreign agents. And already since the start of the year, we have prepared around 30 reports and we participated in 20 events concerning human rights issues. And by the and way, uh, you can read most of our reports because we publish them and they're available on our website in English. Um, yes. Uh, so and why uh, do we rely on our data so much? Because we think that our data helps us to illustrate the systematic nature and the scale of repression and human rights violations in Russia. Because it's one thing to say that there were a lot of people detained during anti-war protests, but it's another thing to indicate that nearly 20,000 detentions were recorded by Ovid Info during anti-war protests. And of course, this data makes our statements and recommendations to the international institutions more credible and reliable. And finally, the international institutions themselves, like the UN bodies and the Committee of Ministers, for example, they uh, do not always have the reliable and updated information on the human rights situation in Russia because, of course, Russian civil society do not provide them such information. But we do, and we have this information. Um, and the advocacy team is delivering this data that Ovid Info collects to the international community by preparing these reports and by participating in the meetings with stakeholders. Next slide, please. And this is especially relevant in the context of war because since the start of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the access to information about the repressions and the human rights violations in Russia has been restricted even more. So, for example, Russian authorities adopted new repressive laws aimed at restricting and silencing the dissent in Russia and started to spread propaganda. Russian authorities also regularly persecute those people who are expressing their anti-war opinion or providing the alternative information about the situation with Ukraine and 
due to all of this, a lot of media outlets and journalists and human rights defenders had to leave Russia or temporarily close their activities. But at the same time, the international community still needs this information and data, especially the information and data from the ground. And OVD Info has this information. We collect this information from the ground because we have lawyers and we have a lot of people who are working on these issues. And we do our best to provide such information. And in the context of war, for example, Dasha mentioned already that OVD Info, since the start of the full scale invasion, started to collect the data on how many people are persecuted for anti war activism, for example. And we at OVD at um, advocacy team also used this information and included in our reports and provided to international communities so they can understand um, what's happening exactly in Russia. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. So, and we, we do know that the UN bodies and other international institutions regularly read our reports and they use the data and information that we provide them for many things. So, for example, when they prepare their own reports or other written materials, or when they have speeches or presentations. And what's important, they rely on our data when they make decisions concerning the human rights situation in Russia. So, for example, last year, uh, we were campaigning for the launch of the OS OSC Moscow mechanism on Russia and the creation of the special rapporteur, the UN special rapporteur on Russia. And we used our data to emphasize the systematic nature of repressions and the human rights violations in Russia and explain that we need this expert. And our advocacy was success successful and this, um, this mechanism was were, were created. And after that, we were cooperating with these two experts very closely. We provide them with a lot of data and information that we had. And as a result, both the <laughs> Moscow Mechanism expert and the Special Operator in Russia, they use our data and they include it in their reports and refer to our data when they were speaking and presenting these reports. Um, the next slide, please. And finally, when we do advocacy, we always try to cooperate with other Russian NGOs and human rights defenders. So, for example, we invite them to uh, draft a report with us or to participate in a meeting with us, with stakeholders, because we think that this joint action and joint reports are more powerful and we can include more information and data of other NGOs and we can show the broader picture what's happening in Russia. And finally, in the eye of the international community, the Russian civil society always looks stronger and more powerful when we act together. Thank you very much. This is all for me. Thank you. So let me please conclude. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that uh, the data on the violation of civil liberties in Russia is uh, very important material for research, especially in the existence context of uh, growing uh, authoritarian in uh, various countries today. On the other hand, we see that uh, knowledge about the repression taking place in Russia today is extremely low globally. So uh, certainly uh, we, over the info, we have this relevant data in these careers. And uh, we are working to make this information more accessible, understandable, more complete. But for us, it is very important to move forward, responding to the real demand of researchers. That's why we hope that this series of seminars will allow us to take a significant step in this uh, direction. Thank you very much.